We're going to raise that hallelujah. That's what we've come for.
Psalmist says, I let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. Amen. That's why he is worthy of our praise. Continue to give it to him. Oh, I see the work of your hands. Galaxy spinning.
of you. I will sing praises to your name almost high. My heart is confident in you. Oh God, my heart is confident. No wonder I can sing your praises. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations. I will sing about your power. Each morning, I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. It's time to sing. 
when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 gathered in your name this morning, Lord. Our desire is to exalt you, to lift you up, to adore you. It's all about you. You're so good to us. How, how we need you and how we love you. Let's just sing that chorus once again, softly, Waymaker. We make a miracle work a promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who you are We make a miracle work a promise keeper light in the darkness my God that is who I asked you last week to do something that entailed that whenever you saw a messy person, that before you judge him or her, that before you are too critical of them, that you would just stop and say in your heart, I know a mess when I see one because I am one. You see, we've all made a mess. We are a mess. And we've messed up things plenty of times. But when we acknowledge our messes, we are just baby steps away from acknowledging God and who he is. So before I go on this morning, I want to just pause and ask those of you who are parents of older youth or parents of adult children, how many of you enjoyed teaching your children to drive a car? Can I see a show of hands? <laughs> I see a couple, three, four, five. Pretty low percentage. Well, like many of you, Chris and I had our challenges in teaching our sons to drive a car. Chris? <laughs> That is mostly true. <laughs> and that challenge was amplified greatly when you don't have a car with automatic transmission. Some of you are going, yeah. We had a little Ford Festiva when our oldest son was learning to drive and it had a four-speed transmission so that you had to know how to shift and how to use a clutch and a brake. Now I'm fully aware that there are some of our, you young adults, you young people that are here this morning who have no idea what I'm talking about 
when I mention a car with a stick shift and something that has a clutch and a brake. Okay? That's all right. Anyway, one day, Chris was taking our oldest son out on a driving lesson when he was 15 or 16 years old. I don't know if it was, he had a, got a farm permit, I think, maybe. I don't know, I remember. 16 then. Again, this car had a stick shift with a clutch, and, one, and on one particular occasion, Greg let that clutch out with a, just too quickly, and it caused that car to chug and to jerk forward. It just so happened that we had a container of straight pins on the dash of the car. And when Greg jerked the car forward, that container of straight pins ended all over the floor of the seat and in Chris's lap, who was in the passenger seat. Straight pins everywhere. I think we were finding straight pins in the car for weeks afterwards. Now, I have a feeling a lot of you parents have your own stories to tell of giving your kids driving lessons. And I'd love to hear them someday. It could be real comedy time, maybe. But here's where I'm going with this message today. For those of you who feel the mess of straight pins all over the car, maybe that's a picture of your life right now. So number one this morning, you have made a mess of something that is so big, maybe, that you're not sure it can ever be cleaned up. It may be your finances. It may be something going on in a significant relationship. It may be something going on with your parents or something going on in your marriage. Maybe you've gotten in trouble with the law. I don't know what it is, but right now you would say, you know what? I look good on the outside. You know, I'm somewhat functional, but there's a disaster that's just going on in my life on the inside. And the mess is so big, I don't really know where to begin. And if you're real honest, you have come to see that this mess is really your fault. Because you either you ignored somebody's advice, you ignored your conscience, you ignored your parents, you ignored your best friend, you ignored God, or you ignored the people that were telling you the truth. You've got a messy part of your life, and you're wondering, what am I going to do? But I, what I hope you discover today is this insight, that your mess has the potential to bring God near to you. John 3, verse 16 is a familiar verse to many people. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In other words, God so loved the, the messy world that God drew near to the messy world and began to demonstrate his love. But it's better than that because the verse after John 3.16 is the one that doesn't get much attention. But this is the verse that maybe you need to hear as you navigate through your messes and ask the question, how will I ever move past this? And so John 3 verse 17 tells us, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So Jesus didn't come into the world to get in the faces of all the messy people and say, do you realize what a mess you've made of your marriage? Do you realize what a mess you've made of your friendships? Do you realize the mess that you've made of your reputation? God did come into this world to enter the lives of messy people and to rescue them from their mess, which means to really rescue us from ourselves. 
And when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, when you read the Gospels, you see this in the most intimate and passionate and personal ways imaginable. So one day Jesus is in the temple teaching and the Pharisees and all the teachers of the law, they drag a woman in there who has messed up her life. She's been accused of adultery. So she's messed up her marriage. She's messed up somebody else's marriage. And she has destroyed her reputation because now everybody in that small community knows what she's done. And after a conversation with her accusers, Jesus stands up and he says to this condemned woman who has totally messed up her life, I do not condemn you. In other words, I'm not going to sentence you to what you deserve. And then Jesus says, look at me and leave your life of sin. Was on a different occasion, Jesus is walking along with a crowd of people and he looks up and there's a tax collector in a tree. This guy named Zacchaeus, who had completely messed up his life. He had taken a job as a tax collector, his first mistake. And then he began to overcharge people for their taxes, hardworking people from the community. And so he was despised and he was hated because of that. And there seemed to be no way out for him, but he still wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus stopped as he's walking along and he looks up at this man and he says, come down from that tree because I'm going to your house. And behind closed do doors in his house, Jesus looks at this mess of a man and he says, I want you to leave your life of sin and follow me. And you can't just walk away from what you've done, Zacchaeus, you've got to pay these people back and to pay them back with interest. And the New Testament tells us that Zacchaeus', Zacchaeus life drastically changed. And I'll give you one more. There was a day when Jesus was in, was in an area of the country that he wasn't supposed to be in because he was a Jew and the Jews and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. And as his disciples went into the little village of Sychar to get food in the middle of the day, Jesus meets a woman who comes to the well all by herself to draw water. Her life is a mess. For she's been married five times. Now that's a lot now. It was a whole lot more back then. And the man that she was living with at the time wasn't her husband. So this woman had a long history of making messes. So while it's just Jesus and her at the well, she expected him to say nothing to her since he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. Not only that, if he knew what kind of mess she had made of her life, there wouldn't be even less reason for him to say anything to her. And yet Jesus says to this woman, essentially, come close to me. I will quench the thirst you've been trying to quench your entire life. So I'm here to tell you this morning, no matter how messy your life is, or how deep the mess is, or how much of it is your fault, you can still come to Jesus and he welcomes you. So secondly, here's what Jesus offered these messy people and what Jesus offers all of us, the gospel. He offers us the gospel. This is the message of Jesus. He offered them and he offers us himself. He offered himself as the solution 
Because the clearest picture of your heavenly father is Jesus. If you want to know what God thinks, read what Jesus says. If you want to know how God responds, watch how Jesus responds. And Jesus came to point to the Father. And Jesus invited messy people to follow him while they were still messy. In fact, immediately following Jesus' encounter with a woman who had been dragged in front of him and accused of adultery, the gospel writer John pens these words in John chapter 8, verse 12, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, maybe you've heard your whole life that Jesus is the light of the world. But maybe to you it's kind of kind of a Christmas thing to you. It doesn't mean much. You're just thinking lights in general. But here's what this means for you. If you've created a mess or you find yourself in a mess, that you are in a dark place and you need a light. And as you watch Jesus navigate his way in and out of the lives of messy people in the New Testament, you can rest assured of this, that your Heavenly Father has invited you and me to follow Jesus, even though our life might be a mess. And more than likely, you were not following Jesus when you made a mess in your life. But what a promise that Jesus makes when he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When you or I are in a mess, do you know what, what we want? You know, we just want to make a call. We want, to, we want somebody to show up and fix it. We want to shake their hand and say, thank you, I will call you the next time I need you. But your heavenly father loves you too much to do it that way because his goal for you is not simply to fix your mess and to clean up things. It's much bigger and broader than that. He is a heavenly father. And every good father wants a relationship with his children. I would rather have imperfect children who love me than perfect children who don't care anything about me. That thing in me as an earthly father is reflected in the heart of your heavenly father. What is most important to your heavenly father is a personal, intimate relationship through the person that made the relationship possible, his son, Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said in John 8, 12, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Elsewhere in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus stated it this way. This is in Matthew 7, verse 24 and following. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But... Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Following Jesus begins 
with this declaration of humility. Essentially, God, I have built my house on the sand and I am, I am reaping what I have sown. God, I've built my finances, I've built my marriage, I've built my occupation or my profession on something that doesn't last. And my house is tumbling down around me, so I need you. You see, following Jesus is agreeing with him when he said that everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice Essentially that Jesus, whatever you ask me to do, I have pre-decided that I am following you. I'm not just looking for advice anymore. I'm surrendering my life and my decision-making abilities to you. We always want a quick fix to our messes, don't we? Your heavenly father is a good father. And he wants something more for you than simply fixing your messes. As light of the world, he shows us how to live a life with fewer regrets and better decisions. He wants to build your life. He wants to build your finances. He wants to build your relationships. He wants to build your parenting. He wants to build your professional life around his teaching. And if you follow his teaching, he will lead you out of your mess. He says, everyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And here's something I don't want you to miss. You can't just pray your way out of a mess that you've behaved your way into. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic prayer. And that's not because God doesn't care. Rather, he cares so much that 2,000 years ago, he shone a light bright enough so that if you chose to follow him, you could have avoided your current mess. So my third point, you cannot pray your way out of a mess that you behaved your way into you can follow your way out. And so our Heavenly Father invites you and invites me to follow his son out of our messes and God will meet you in the mess. He is not offended by you and he does not condemn you. But he sees your mess as an opportunity for you to invite him in and to let him lead. So in this room and in our community are men and women whose stories go something like this. And I'm summarizing. Whose stories go something like this. I messed up. I gave up. I looked up and God showed up. I messed up, I gave up, I looked up and God showed up. Maybe that's your story. It's not just preacher talk. And it not only happened 2,000 years ago with people who were a mess. This is the story every single day currently of people who are messes but who have been redeemed from their mess. How fortunate we are to have a Savior who does that. God showed up and he taught us to follow his son. And some of these people will also tell you that it took the mess, that if it had not been for the mess, there would not have been the personal meeting between them and their Heavenly Father. Because before the mess, God was only an idea. Before the mess, God was out there somewhere. 
but as a result of the mess, God showed up and God became more personal than God has ever been before. And so today, I'm going to ask you, if there's any of you to do something similar to what Jesus asked Matthew to do and what Jesus asked Zacchaeus to do and what Jesus asked the woman at the well to do. I'm going to ask you that if you are ready to follow Jesus out of your mess, that you would do so. It's going to be a bit uncomfortable but if Matthew and Zacchaeus and the woman at the well could respond in their messes, so can you. So if you're here today and you would say, you know what? You're talking to me. And so I am ready to publicly admit that I have messed up and that I am ready to follow Jesus. If he's really the light of the world, then he can lead me out of my mess, and I'm going to follow him. So if you're giving up, if you're looking up, and if you're hoping God will show up, is what I'm going to ask you to do. Just ask you to stand publicly right where you're sitting to identify that Jesus is is the one you are going to follow, okay? Just in this moment of silence, if that's what you would like to do, just asking you to just stand up at your chair, and then we're going to pray together in a short time. Just give you a moment. Maybe some of, for some of you, God is nudging you, saying, turn to me in your mess. Give up the life that you're trying to live and live the life that I'm offering to you. If you'd like to follow him, just stand up right now. Okay. I said earlier, we're all messes, right? So why don't we all stand, since we're all in the same boat, we're all messes. And because we've all been one, and because we are one, or we're a decision or two away from becoming a mess, let me just pray for you, and then we're going to have our final song together. Heavenly Father, thank you for Matthew and his courage. Thank you for the woman at the well and her courage. For Zacchaeus, or for other people in our lives who have inspired us to follow Jesus. I pray that we would be willing to stand, take a public stand for you, and to declare our faith in you amidst the mess that we have in our lives. That this would be the beginning of, maybe for some, first steps with Jesus. Not just out of their mess, but first steps in an authentic relationship with the Savior of the world. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you for not condemning us, but for receiving us as your very own. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.
searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you know why, cause you know just what you need me before we say a word. Your good, good father, it's who you are. friend somewhere I'd ask you to do that we've all been in our messes and Jesus is the light of the world to everyone he wants to be your light he wants to be your savior we'd love to share that good news with you the gospel of Jesus Christ he promises he's knocking on the door of your heart don't delay you're missing out in that relationship that he offers you. So let's pray together as we close this morning. Jesus, we're just thrilled that as our Savior, as God sent you into this world for our messes and our need, just so much in our lives that we cannot do ourselves, really nothing that we can do ourselves. But because of you, Jesus, we have access to a good, good Father. And we are known by Him and blessed by Him. And we find our life in Him. 